Good morning. My name is John Pavlovitz. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I'd like to welcome all those who are here in person, those who are watching online. Uh, it's been a joy for me to be a guest of the Myers Park Baptist community. You have been so hospitable and welcoming to me. And we've had some great conversations over the past two days about cultivating a working theology of empathy that embodies the compassionate heart of Jesus. And we spent time talking about the importance of learning others' stories as we journey and about acknowledging the universal grief that we carry as we live this life, as we lose in this life. We talked about the epidemic of loneliness that so many are experiencing. And we talked about the importance of understanding the lenses through which we view this world. And lastly, we talked about the power of fear and the way it moves us and the way it burdens all of us. And I wanted to spend some time talking about these things today. Now, it's a joy for me to be here because I could drive here living in Raleigh, and normally I'm flying all over the country. And that's not really a great thing for me because I'm not that strong a flyer. Because what invariably happens is I'm on a plane and at some point I realize I'm in a large metal tube hurling through space and I become uneasy. <laughs> and I was flying one day to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I was having an enjoyable experience. I was sitting there in my little elementary school-sized chair. <laughs> and I had my Dixie cup of soda and my Barbie doll sized bag of pretzels, and I had some music on, and I was enjoying myself for someone who's certain they're gonna die on an airplane. <laughs> my enjoyment was interrupted by a voice, and it was the voice of the pilot. And I know this because he said, oh, folks, this is the pilot speaking. He said, I'd like the flight attendants to suspend drink service. I'd like you to go to your seats and put on your seatbelts because we're about to hit a little chop. He said this word chop. And that got my attention. And he began to talk about weather we were approaching as if we had not already been in weather. But then he said, it's going to get a little choppy. And I knew from my experience that choppy was pilot speak, for we are about to be shaken like a snow globe in the hands of an angry toddler, right? <laughs> I knew that choppy meant I was about to contemplate my life choices one more time while wedged between two strangers. Choppy meant that I was about to make a lot of promises to God and what I would do if we land safely, very few of which I intended to keep. But the pilot was very matter-of-factly in his way, saying to us, hold on, prepare yourselves, turbulence is coming. And growing up in the church, that was a sentiment that I understood because in the Gospel of John, in the 16th chapter, Jesus is preparing his disciples, his students, people he loves for the time he is going to be away from them. And he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus was telling his disciples and those who would follow him in the ways of compassion and mercy and love and justice, hold on, prepare yourselves, turbulence is coming. So I drove here from Raleigh, North Carolina to give you a message today. Friends, hold on, prepare yourselves. Turbulence is coming. Actually, I'm a little late, aren't I? <laughs> Turbulence took the earlier flight out to Charlotte, I've heard. Have you had any turbulence in your journey on the way to the spot in which you sit today? When I say turbulence, I bet you can describe exactly who and what that turbulence looks like. These are especially turbulent days in this country for women, for the LGBTQ community, for people of color, for Muslims. These are turbulent days in our nation, and because of that, these are turbulent days within each of us. Most of us at any given moment are experiencing the storms. 
We are always experiencing the shaking of being human. As we live alongside others and as we find our identities and love people and engage the world, we are going to experience turbulence in the form of opposition and conflict and difficulties, things that bring worry and grief and anxiety and yes, fear. Turbulence and fear are often a package deal. The storms come and they create in us anxiety. And when turbulence does come, we find ourselves having to choose between peace and fear. And fear can be very persuasive because it knows exactly what buttons to push in us because we are the writers of our fear stories. We give consent to the things that terrify us. This is true of the actual storms in our house. I have two daughters, one human, one canine. <laughs> Sayla and Zoe, respectively. Now, there are very different responses of my daughters to the storms. Our dog, Zoe, she will always tell us when a storm is coming because we can't find her. And invariably, we realize that she's in the tub. And so she's like a little furry meteorologist. We see her in the tub, oh, storm's coming. So she's in there shaking, unable to move. Now my daughter, Sayla, when she was younger, she would hear the thunder and she would immediately begin to scream and run from wherever she was and be hyper and she couldn't calm down and I had to try and calm her. So two different responses to the storms. One of my daughters was frozen, the other frantic. More on that in a little bit. Friends, fear is universal. It comes with our operating systems. None of us in this room, watching online, none of us are immune to fear. None of us can escape its debilitating side effects. No matter how much we try and fortify ourselves or how brave a face we fake or how we try to live defensively or even listen, how earnest our faith is. Our politics, our religion, the color of our skin, the amount of zeros in our paychecks, not one of these things fully insulates us from the terror that visits us time and again through circumstances, through people. Turbulence is coming and yes, fear is waiting in it. And here's the positively gut-punching thing about fear. It's the way it matures along with us, how our nightmares tend to grow up as we do. When I was five years old, I was terribly afraid of one of the Sesame Street Muppets. I'm not gonna tell you which one, I don't wanna prejudice you. But I can tell you that today, friends, after a long bit of work in 53 years, I've made peace with all the Muppets. But see, Though our childhoods have been plagued with vampires and ghoulish monsters beneath the bed, things that now seem largely ridiculous to our adult selves, we don't let ourselves off the hook from fear when adulthood approaches, do we? We never outgrow it. We don't discard fear as a traveling companion. We just trade it in for more age-appropriate models. We may leave behind creepy baby dolls and shadowed boogeymen in the closets, right? But we pick up fears of financial disaster. We pick up fears of relational collapse. We pick up fears of war, of dying alone, of worrisome spots on CAT scans. And as a result, at every age in this life, we are equally susceptible to a poverty of courage and to a wealth of fear. And regardless of the things that trigger our terrors, the effects on us are similar. We usually have one of two negative responses to fear. We either become frozen, unable to move, or frantic, unable to rest. And I wonder what your response to fear has been in these days. Are you like my dog, frozen, unable to move? Or are you like my daughter, frantic, unable to rest? Because neither of these is anything God wants for us, friends. We can visit these places, but we are not intended to live there. 
But as I've been talking for a little bit about fear and about the turbulence of being human, I want you to understand something because you're probably thinking about the things that terrify you, but this is about more than your fear and your shaking. This is about the turbulence of other people that you are called to step into as agents of empathy in this world. The story of Jesus today reminds us that we live in the tension between the peace givers and the fear bringers. And we see the fear bringers everywhere, don't we? Preying on the vulnerable and leveraging people's prejudices and wielding power to control. In his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, African-American theologian Howard Thurman talks about fear, and in essence, he says, fear is universal, but all fear is not experienced equally because not all people are equally exposed to fear. Not everyone experiences the same turbulence. He says, fear is one of the persistent hounds of hell that dog the footsteps of the poor, the dispossessed, the disinherited. There is nothing new or recent about fear. It is doubtless as old as the life of man on the planet. But then he says the ever-present fear that besets the vast poor, the economically and socially insecure, is a fear of still a different breed. It is a climate closing in. It is like the fog in San Francisco or in London. It is nowhere in particular, yet everywhere. Thurman talks about the specific fear experienced by marginalized and vulnerable communities. And he says that there is a helplessness that comes when you're not only terrified by the circumstances, but by the entire system that you exist in. And in that space, people can begin to doubt their capacity to withstand, their ability to overcome, their possibility of victory. And the truth is, privilege is a natural buffer against some turbulence. It is a fear insulator. It is a barrier against some of the fear bringers. Now, as a white, cisgender, heterosexual man, that doesn't mean I'll never experience fear. It just means I will never understand the specific terrors of being a woman existing at this place and time in the history of this nation. It doesn't mean that I will not be overwhelmed at times, but I will never live inside the head and the body of a transgender teenager trying to navigate through this life right now. It doesn't mean that I'll never feel as though things are hopeless, but I will never understand the hopelessness of being an undocumented immigrant in this particular place and time in America. Friends, this is why it is our responsibility to leverage our lives and our privilege and our platform to be peace givers and not fear bringers on this planet. To speak into injustice, to decrease the turbulence other people experience and to risk that shaking upon ourselves. Because it's important to remember where fear comes from. It comes from the feeling that we cannot control our circumstances. If I lose control, I, I fill that space with fear. That's why the turbulence on the airplane is so terrifying to me because I realize I'm powerless to change the present conditions that I am in. I texted my host when I was getting ready to leave for Albuquerque that day and I said, flight about to leave. And she texted back to me what she thought was encouraging, encouraging words to me, which you've probably texted to someone at some point in time. She said, okay, be safe. I texted back, I'm just gonna be sitting here. You tell that to the pilot and the weather. See, the pilot and the weather are outside of my control and it's easy to believe that my peace or my fear rests in those things outside of my control. But that, friends, is not our story, is it? Though I can't affect the pilot or the weather, I do have control in the turbulence. I have control in my response to it. I can alter my inner weather. That is the essential spiritual journey. It is being able to transcend our conditions because of what we know. And I love this story in the Gospels because it is a living parable 
about fear. The disciples literally experience a flood of fear and the storm comes as, as, and as happens in our lives, panic accompanies. They're overwhelmed with fear, the disciples, even though they know Jesus, even though they have seen his heart and they have watched him do beautiful work and they have been invited with him on this journey, still, they're overwhelmed by the circumstances and they allow their circumstances to dictate their internal condition. They allow what they see to make them forget what they know. Have these days allowed you or caused you to forget what you know? Have you stopped imagining a God that is massive enough to hold you in all of this? Have you become unable to move or unable to rest because you no longer remember who invited you on this journey to begin with and who resides with you? The disciples freak out in the middle of the chaos and they look for Jesus to bail them out and they find him in the back of the boat, power napping, because Jesus knows who he is. That's why the pilot on my plane isn't upset by the turbulence because he has a knowledge that I don't have. He has the threat right-sized. And the challenge we have today as people of faith, morality, and conscience is to have the threats right size to cultivate a peace that transcends all that we are experiencing, a peace that is bigger than the threat. The question is not whether we will be placed into storms or not. The question is how much of the storms we're going to allow to be placed within us. How much of the exterior threat we're going to allow inside. Are we going to be internally turbulent and profoundly turbulent times. Friends, whether your turbulence is delivered by a cruel family member or a former friend or a stranger on social media or a predatory politician or a brimstone preacher or a system that is corrupt, remembering who you are and whose you are is critical because the disciples panic and Jesus is sleeping. If God is God, then God is not overwhelmed by the things that overwhelm you. If God is God, God is not surprised by the shaking you are experiencing, not taken aback by the trouble you face. If God is God, then God is not intimidated by your questions or your faith crises. So you need to ask yourself, just what God do I believe in? See, the disciples wake Jesus, and they say to him, don't you care about us? And that's our response too. When the shaking comes, we question why. And Jesus responds that they have a limited menu on this trip, fear or faith, which would you like? They cannot inhabit the same space easily. And to trust God is to affirm faith even when the evidence makes that choice counterintuitive. It is to see the world in turmoil and to still be steadfast in believing that love will have the last loudest word. Because the story tells us that there is a rival on the other side, that there is wonder and awe waiting for us. And you know this. You know that you have traveled through things that you never thought you could travel through. Can we retrospectively look at our lives and realize that this too we shall be moved through? Do not fear. It's the most prevalent command in the scriptures and it's the one we follow the least. It is the golden tether running through the scriptures, the assurance that faith is the antidote to all that terrifies us. It is the steady declaration that if God is indeed God, then we are safe and loved and that all will be well. Friends, everyone around you, the people you share the grocery store line with, the people you pass in traffic, the people you sit next to at work, the people in your kitchen are all experiencing the storms, they are fighting to find peace and to push back fear. And in these days of great shaking, we may need to become the turbulence to others, 
to the fear bringers who deny people's humanity, to those who exclude and discriminate against someone based on an unchangeable part of who they are. We may have to become the turbulence to those of our own faith tradition or even our own local community who oppose the compassionate heart of Jesus. With our hands and our voices and our resources and platforms, we must risk becoming the turbulence to the powerful and the privileged. We need to be the kind of people who bring peace to those who are being shaken. I told you about my two daughters. My, my dog, I can't do anything to help her. I've tried. But one day when my daughter Sayla was frantic in the storm, I took her out onto the porch and I put her on my lap and I began to explain to her how the storm worked. Now I needed to Google that, but I did. And I told her how the storm worked. And as I talked to her, something happened. Her heart rate slowed down and her breathing returned to normal and she put her full weight in my lap. And we just began to slowly enjoy the storm together and now, even though she's in middle school, whenever the thunder cracks, she comes from wherever she is in the house and she said, Dad, let's go sit in the storm. And that is our time together. And I did two things for Selah that day. I right-sized the storm for her and I reminded her of my presence in it. May you have your fears right-sized today. May you be a peace giver and not a fear bringer. May you be willing to engage the turbulence of others. May you be willing to become the turbulence to others. May you find rest in the storms and may you not allow the turbulence around you to create a storm within you. And may you see all that presently shakes you in the eyes of a love that holds us all. It's just a little chop. Hear the words of Jesus. To the storms within you, peace be still. To your worries about the future, peace be still. To the terrors that keep you up at night, peace be still. To the discord in our nation, peace be still. To all that is out of our control, peace be still. Hear the words, peace be still. Amen.